from Philippians. Philippians chapter number 4, if you would please. Philippians chapter number 4. I so uh, enjoyed the family emphasis sessions from Pastor Golemez and Pastor Cowling and from Pastor Ouellette and from Pastor McCurdy. Just some great help, I think, to all of us. Going back to our passage in Philippians chapter 4 in verses 8 and 9. If you would there, Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Just a reminder, if you have not downloaded the church app, you can. And uh, from there, you can follow along in sermon notes. And the Bible passage is also there for your help as well. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for the time we had tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us as we look at your word that your spirit would touch our hearts. I'd ask you to help me to say those things that would be true to your word, that would be beneficial in explaining and giving the meaning of this passage, Lord. But I can't do it without your help. I pray that your word would not return void and that it would touch us. And Lord, that it would change us so that we would be like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. I've entitled this message, Pristine Thoughts. If I had to have another title for it, I, I would find one and I would say it like this, uh, you shouldn't eat yellow snow. That's something you'll learn in Michigan, you don't eat yellow snow. I'm sure you've woke up like I have on a beautiful Michigan morning, and you look outside and a fresh snowfall over the ground, and it just looks absolutely beautiful, doesn't it? And, and then those, some of those special mornings when it captures uh, the, the, the tree branches, right? And you know, it's just beautiful. You, you young people are eagerly turning on the television to see if there's a snow day from Bridgeport Baptist Academy, and, and there would be, except now with Pastor Goldham as you don't get those snow days anymore. I'm just kidding, of course. And, and then uh, your parents are, are begging the Lord to not have a snow day. You want to be stuck with your kids all day, what to do with them. You drive on the road and some of you get to make that first set of tracks in the snow and it's just a wonderful thing. But, but before long in Michigan, you know this, and you're coming home that afternoon or a little bit later on and the salt trucks have been out and people have been out and now the beautiful white snow is dark and dingy and dirty. The animals have been running around the yard, and the beautiful, pristine yard now has yellow snow and footprints. I didn't grow up in Michigan. I grew up for a lot of years in Florida. I came to Michigan. Uh, I learned very quickly not to eat yellow snow. It's not lemonade now, is it? You say, well, Pastor Howell, that's disgusting and crude and crass. Well, this verse says this, to think on things that are pure. Think on things that are pure, and uh, the Bible wants us to have thoughts that are cleaned up, that are pristine. The Bible wants us to have purity in our thoughts. It includes lustful and wrong and evil and wicked thoughts, and, and God wants me to clean up our minds. He wants them to be chaste or innocent. Or if we say it this way, He wants our minds to be unspotted. He wants our minds to be unspotted. Now, I'm going to do something that you should not do. If you're a pastor, you should not do this. I'm going to ask my wife to come up here and help me real quick here. All right? Now, this is, you know, this is good for my marriage, I'm sure, in some way, shape, or form. I actually asked her first, and uh, she begrudgingly said yes. Now, honey, I, no, right here. That's the first step, if you would, please. I'm going to pay for this for the rest of my life, Pastor. You, you should have warned me about this. Okay. On my wife's left hand, if you can zoom in, gentlemen, she has a beautiful diamond ring. I have gray paint on my finger. She has a beautiful diamond <laughs> ring. Beautiful diamond ring that I purchased for her. I didn't know much about diamond rings before I had to buy her a diamond ring. This diamond ring was not easy to get. This diamond was not an easy purchase in my life. Those of you who know the story will know that my wife um, did not want to get engaged uh, for a year after we began dating. I was under no such conviction in my life. <laughs> After about six months, and Pastor, I think you remember, about six months, I knew that well, I believed and I was pretty sure that this woman right here would be my wife and my baby's mama. Oh, my heart. <laughs> uh, it's going to be, it's going to be. <laughs> well, she had said that to me, and I thought it was the most foolish thing I'd ever heard waiting a year. So in January, I called a jeweler I knew in California, I'm sorry, in Colorado, 
called him and said, I need a ring this size, looks like this. And we had some trouble wiring money and getting the thing back. And before you know it, I, ha- I got the ring two weeks before our one-year dating anniversary. So on our one year, from the first time I went on a date, one year I asked her to be my wife, and she said yes. And then she later on said, I thought it was so sweet of you that you waited a whole year and respected my wishes. And I said, honey, I tried to order this ring for four months, and I couldn't get it here. But I learned something when I was studying diamonds, like, like some of you have learned, or you ask a lady to marry you, that there's four characteristics of a diamond. The four C's, they call them, right? The first one is the cut. What the cut of the diamond makes a difference in how brilliant it is. All right, then they had the, the color of the diamond. Will this diamond look white or will it look yellow? No one wants a yellow diamond unless you're trying to buy a yellow diamond. Then you have the carrot. How big is the rock? The advice I give to young men, buy as big as you can. No one, no lady has yet turned down a big diamond. I have unfortunately seen ladies try to hide a diamond. All right, when they, maybe it was too small. But, but I tell you, you get the right diamond, men, and your fiancé who was right-handed becomes left-handed, right? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, look at that. There's your left hand. I'm just touching my hair. Oh, here's my phone like that, right? That's how that happens to them. But the last C, there's cut and there's color and carrot. The last C is clarity. How clean is the diamond? They have a rating system for imperfections in a diamond. And this diamond appears very good. Of course, only the best for my wife, right? Oh, shucks. And this diamond right here, though, but there's a term. There's a term in diamond hunting, and it's called eye clean. You can have a diamond that appears from a human eye to be perfect and clean and pure, but it actually has many imperfections that are visible only when magnified. Tonight I'm going to look at this passage and this particular word, pure. In this sense, I'm going to challenge us tonight to not have a mind that is only I clean. Wouldn't it be a shame that if our mind in this particular passage talks about being pure, so things are pure, wouldn't it be a shame if our minds were only pure, or what appear to be pure from the outside? To everyone else, but under the the microscope of God and His Word, filled with imperfections. You see, the Bible wants us to have thoughts, to have a mind that is unspotted, that is innocent, that is clean. Tonight, we're going to look at that at this particular word and open up some of the truths I believe God has for us, so that our minds are not only just I clean. I have two questions for you tonight. The first question is this: Do I? Do I allow my thoughts to be contaminated by outside influences rather than cleansed by God? Do I allow my thoughts, the first thought, to be contaminated by outside influences rather than cleansed by God? You know that if I allow outside influences, then my mind will begin to be spotted It will not be pure from imperfections and blemishes. Do you understand that that the outside influences, we'll talk about some of those things tonight, all right, um, will cause my thinking, all right, my mind to not be pure or holy or what is cleaned up for God. I'm not talking just about wicked and lustful thoughts, though that is inherently included. But I'm talking in a broader sense that our minds may not be pure and holy before God because we've allowed other influences to spot it, to contaminate us. How much contamination is too much? Well, it depends on what it is, right? How much water is too much water in your gas tank? A couple drops could be okay, but a gallon would probably cause a problem. How much sand, how much sand do you want in your whipped cream? That gritty, ugh. The answer would be very little. How much rat poison do you want on your pizza? Just a dusting, please. Just a touch, just a smidge. And how much of the world influence do you want... Or do you allow on your thinking? 
You see, there's a few influences that, if we're not careful, will begin to influence us the wrong way. The first is the influence of culture. The influence of culture. In the influence of culture, there are ways that they think that would spot our minds. And thoughts like this, that kids just need to be expressive. Well, kids are naturally expressive. I had young children, toddlers, they're naturally expressive. They express themselves very clearly and very well. If they don't like what you're saying, they figure out how to communicate that, don't they? Kids are naturally expressive, but the world's thinking says, no, listen, let your kids express. The world's thinking is this way, the influence of culture. Well, live life like you want to. Don't let someone else dictate your life, grab your own life, all right, and live it like you want to. There's the influence of culture and its philosophy. There are doctors on TV that will tell you how to, how to have good mental health, how to have a good relationship. And they're filled with influences that are carnal, that are fleshly, that are not according to what God says. They don't say others first, they say me first. That will cause our thinking to be spotted. See, Proverbs 16.25 says this, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You see, it seems right, it appears right, and oh, this will work, but the Bible says that way is the way of death. What is, what seems to be right, what is culturally acceptable, may not be right. Think about through the history, times of what culture thought and what was reality. The earth being round. Culture said it was flat. The Bible says it's round. Culture said to drain your blood. The Bible said the life of the flesh is in the blood. Just in a light note, the Bible is always right. It's not a history book, but anytime it mentions history, it's true. It's not a science book, but anytime it mentions a science, it's accurate. You see, if we're not careful, culture, carnality, or culture will influence our, our thinking. Of course, I can't talk about this without talking about social media and current culture. I know when I say that it's some of you uh, flee social media, but there's many of you who do not flee from social media. There's many of you who embrace it wholeheartedly. There's some of us who, not us, I shouldn't say us, some of you enjoy getting in arguments on social media. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of space. There's some of you that, that get all of your entertainment from, it, from media. You wouldn't know a book if it hit you on the head. Your music, entertainment, social media, all those things can be acceptable, but they all have the potential to spot our minds, to spot our thinking. And he says, what sort of things are, are pure, are unspotted? I mentioned this on Sunday, but I have uh, come to the habit of when I first wake up, grab my phone and turn to a psalms. I don't want the first thing that I look at on my phone to be a message from somebody else or any other news. I want it to be God's Word. I want my mind to be controlled and cleansed all right, by God, not contaminated by the world. It's culture. There's also the, though, the influence of carnality. The influence of carnality. There are ways we can allow our minds to fester and to wander that will spot our minds. Doors once unlocked are very difficult to relock, if not impossible. Sometimes it can be in irritations or anger. You can allow your mind to wander well, to wander well, I just want to tell them what I think. And carnality takes over. You think about just giving it right to them and sticking it right to them, it could be to a boss. And all of a sudden our thinking becomes spotted by our carnality. You may not know this about yourself, but I know this about myself, that typically my flesh doesn't want to do right. Now look at that. If someone cuts me off, my flesh wants to cut them off. If someone cuts my place in line, my flesh wants to take that back from them and say, wait, you stand down, sister. That's my flesh, that's carnality. And if I allow that to influence my thinking, my thinking will not be pure, it will be spotted. Yes. But I can put out a good front, can't I? Can't you? Yep. I could appear to be eye clean. I could have a good smile, carry a big Bible. 
and yet have thoughts of carnality and unpure, impure thoughts. Carnality can influence our minds in ways and cause us to be contaminated. And the influ influence of emotion in my life. My heart and my feelings can spot my thinking. While my flesh is, is often against me, it doesn't want to do the things that are right, my emotions can go all over the place. It can be like a, it can be like a junior high girl. Like a roller coaster, up and down, left and right. No offense, junior high girls, it's just reality of life. You don't know if they're happy or sad. You can't tell. Well, you can tell, you just don't want to know sometimes. Sometimes our heart can be that way. We've seen it, unfortunately, during this time of COVID-19, right? People who have been left and right and all over the place, up and down. Sometimes we see it on a, on a maybe a legislative level as well, right? We see things that go all over the place, back and forth and up and down. You see, my, my heart and my feeling can, can spot my thinking. There are all these influences. My thoughts must be pure and holy and clean from outside influences. Remember the first time that I learned not to eat yellow snow. You see, I wasn't just saying that just because it actually, I remember the situation. It's not what you think. We just come to Michigan. I don't remember how long we'd been here. Uh, just a few months. I know it was early on, and and it snowed. I was born in Pensacola, Florida. We don't get too much snow in Pensacola, Florida. Come up to Michigan, and and uh, boy, there's snow. And man, snow is is beautiful. I love Michigan. We're looking forward to having snow this Friday or Saturday. What a blessing! Why not? Why not? I think snow in the morning and maybe 55 or 60 later on in the day. Welcome to Michigan. You don't blame me, look it up after the service. We're at a gas station. We're at a gas station, and on the gas pump, there was some yellow snow. I don't know what possessed me to do this. I was probably nine or ten years old, somewhere in there, so I wasn't using all of my, uh, all of my facilities. I have those aged boys, and so I know what that looks like. I speak from experience. And I do remember, though, looking at this, oh, look at that, that's yellow snow, and I grabbed some off the gas pump, and I ate it. Have you ever eaten gas before? It tastes just like it smells, right? It was disgusting. I spit it out and I learned right then that you don't eat yellow snow. Now you say, Pastor Howell, you are an idiot. Yes, yes, a moron. Yes, yes. But I learned a valuable lesson that day. I learned that it wasn't like it appeared to be. If we're not careful, we'll have, we'll have our mind contaminated. Yes. And we say, oh, that's a good path to go down. That's a good path to run down. That's a good influence. But yet, if we're not careful, it'll spot our thinking and our minds will not be pure. They'll be contaminated instead of cleansed. I have another question tonight for you. Second question tonight is this. Do I allow my thoughts to be derailed by outside influences rather than driven by God. You see, there's, there's a contamination that can happen, but there's also a derailment, getting knocked off the tracks of the proverbial train of your mind. A derailment can happen. We were at the boys in a soccer league, all right, until... Life was shut down by, by uh, COVID-19. Right? You can't do anything right now, right? But before that, we had boys in a, in a soccer league, Frankenmuth. And they, uh, as parents, we had to sign a few things. We had to sign that we'd behave ourselves at, at games. Now, that was a wonderful thing, parents. All right, parents of sports, I, I can pause right there, all right? You got to behave yourself at the games, all right? And keep your mouth shut. Uh, you know, even if your, you know, little baby maybe got knocked over, that's what they have refs there for, all right? Will the refs miss it? Absolutely. Did they miss it on purpose? You better believe it, all right? They actually know your child. And before the game, the other team paid them to ignore your child whenever they're injured, and they're trying to send your child to the hospital. Right, you know, I believe it. That's what you think when you're yelling. But anyway, we had to sign a statement that, that we would keep our mouth shut. And then they had this little statement in there, and I didn't know what it meant. It said, no joysticking. No joysticking. 
I'm like, what does it mean to joystick? That doesn't make any sense, you know. I thought, is this some, you know, some Hebrew word? What is joysticking? No. Joysticking comes from playing video games. In a video game, you have a joystick and you direct, you direct your, your, your character on the screen. And they didn't want us as parents joysticking the players. All right? They wanted the players to listen to their coach instead of their co-coach, so-called parents, right? I had the privilege of refing girls' soccer for a number of years. I refed in this area, MHSAA games, and refed a number of schools, local schools. And I witnessed, when they said that, I, I remembered different times when I witnessed joysticking. The coach have a tremendous plan to score a goal, and you, you'd hear a mom or a dad yell, you know, take the shot, and they're a hundred yards from the goal, other end of the field. Supposed to, you've seen it in basketball, take the shot, mom, I'm on the bench, that's all right, you know, right, joysticking. They don't want us to joystick, apparently they, they think that if you have a coach, the coach ought to set the game plan for the players. Well, isn't that interesting? I don't believe that God wants anything else to joystick our thoughts. All right, you see that? I don't want my thoughts to be derailed, not only contaminated, that's a different issue, but also these other influences can derail, they can begin to joystick, all right, and now my thoughts are not controlled by God, they're not pure, but they are derailed instead of driven by God. What can derail my thoughts? I'm looking at a few things that will derail my thoughts and not be allowed to have pure thoughts. How about the book of James, which says it this way, ye adulterers and adulteresses. He makes a harsh accusation. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You say, well, pastor, I read John three sixteen. for God so loved the world. Well, James is referring here specifically to the world as a system that is against God and His way, all right, and His truth. And if I cozy up to a system that is anti-God or anti-Christ, I am now, the Bible says, uh, having spiritual adultery. James brings a harsh term in, a shocking term, to bring us back to reality, to say, listen, you know, what you do, who you buddy up with, all right, is a really big deal to God. Pure thoughts. Thoughts that aren't joysticked by something else. See, some thoughts are real and some thoughts are not real. We build situations in our mind and in our life. We allow our flesh to construct what is real versus what is right versus God. But what do you mean by that? Well, let me give you a few things. Sometimes we look for temporary relief instead of healing. Temporary, temporary relief is no replacement for true healing. You see, the Bible brings true healing to, to a Christian. All right? To an unsaved person, it brings the healing of sin, and to a Christian, it brings victory in my life. I can find temporary relief. You see, if I am angry, all right, and I act in that anger, a guy cuts me off, and I cut him off, I feel better temporarily. Right? For a moment, for just a little bit of time, I feel good. Temporarily, temporary relief, no replacement for healing. Well, in that situation, the healing comes from forgiveness. That's a pure thought. But if I respond, then I'm now driven. I now had a joystick action, all right, from this emotion. It was driven by an outside influence. Temporary relief is no replacement for true healing. We see it. Sometimes with injuries. I can make myself feel better, right? But that's not what the doctor wants to do or it's not what the dentist wants to do. The dentist wants to drill. I just want pain medication. It won't fix the problem. If I'm not careful, I will allow my mind, all right, to say, just give me the pain medication and my problem will be a whole lot worse. Temporary relief is no replacement for healing. And sometimes God's word, through our thoughts, wants to drill. He's a much better dentist than any dentist you've ever gone to before. He drills just right, and the drill doesn't sound nearly so bad. But temporary relief is no replacement for healing. Temporary bliss is no replacement for real joy. 
Turn on your television, you'll see a commercials, or you'll see a commercial. And if you watch long enough, though I mute commercials at our house, you should think about doing the same thing. I don't want that music in our house. I don't need to want more things. I want enough things as it is. But if you leave it on long enough, you'll probably come across a advertisement for alcohol. Right? And what do they show you? They show you temporary bliss. Always in a beautiful, sunny setting, sometimes on a beach, you know, or not always in a sunny setting, but often in a sunny setting. People having a good time, right? Usually younger people, is it not? It's normally not 70, 80, it's younger people. They're just having a good time. They're laughing and their drinks are sloshing and everything. They don't show you the puke the next morning. They don't show you the broken homes and the broken lives. They don't show you the careers that are, that are, that are completely gone and the marriages that are destroyed and the kids that have been abused by, by fathers or mothers who have become alcoholics. Temporary bliss is no replacement for real joy. If I were to show you a commercial for being a Christian... I could show you people of all ages, could I not? I could show you young people, I could show you middle-aged people, I could show you senior saints. They'd have a smile on their face sometimes, they may have a tear in their eyes other times. They'd often be in church smiling, they'd, they'd be singing in praise to God. If you were to follow those commercials, those same people, if you took the ones from the beer commercials and followed them 50 years, I wonder what those commercials look like. If you took the ones that I were to make and follow those young people 50 years, I know what those would look like. We're filled in our churches with those people. We have some great people that, like that at First Baptist Church. You'd see husband and wives still together, all right, serving and loving God. You'd see maybe one where a spouse has passed on, yet there's still joy, unmistakable joy, unexplainable joy that only comes from God because temporary bliss is no replacement for real joy. See, but our minds... Other influences will tell us, no, this is where you can find joy, peace, and happiness. What do I mean by this? Temporary gratification is no replacement for real fulfillment. Temporary gratification is no replacement for real fulfillment. One of the hardest concepts in life to gain control over is delayed gratification. Waiting for something better. Sacrificing the here and now for something better later on. That's why we sing that song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. There's a lot of toys down here, are there not? There are cars and houses and boats, chainsaws and tools, diamonds and clothes and shoes. But real fulfillment comes when we're in heaven forever and ever with our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, I can allow my thoughts <clears throat> to be derailed by outside influences. But when I do, my thoughts have now become spotted. They become blemished. What we ought to do is we ought to play a little game that we like to call follow the leader. It's a wonderful game when you're in uh, elementary school, is it not? Up and down, back and forth, all over the place. I read an account of when some men followed their leader. It's the Thunderbirds. They're the Air Force acrobatic playing team. It's around 1981 or so, I believe. When there were four of the Thunderbirds flying and practicing their diamond formation. One, two, three, four. They are skilled and accomplished pilots. I grew up being able to see some of these demonstrations. Of course, being in Pensacola, I got to see the Blue Angels growing up. Later on, we'd go to air shows. I saw the Thunderbirds in Chicago. An amazing day when Thunderbirds came. Two of them came blasting over our heads and about scared the pants off most of the crowd. I happened to see them circle the skyscrapers. Excellent pilots. I am told, though, when they do this diamond maneuver, that they only follow the lead number one aircraft. Wherever he goes, they follow him implicitly. This particular day, they were in such a, such a formation, sometimes within six feet or less of each other. I think that's amazing to fly a, a jet aircraft that close. All right, My brother, who is a, a, now a flight instructor for the Navy, teaches young pilots how to fly in formation. formation. And I told him, I think he's nuts. All right, let's go really fast and drive really close. Where if you have a mistake, you go, okay. 
They were practicing the four diamond, this, this diamond maneuver, training for an air show in Arizona. They were climbing side by side for several thousand feet and began their slow backward loop, hurling down toward the ground at over 400 miles per hour. It's supposed to level off at right around 100 feet. 100 feet. It seems like a lot, but at 400 miles an hour, it's nothing. It's called a line of breast loop. When there was a malfunction with the number one Thunderbird. So before they used the F-16s, these, I believe, a T-38 at that time or one other such uh, plane. And there's a little too much play in his stick. He's hurling down. Apparently, he, they, did, they discovered afterwards that he could, not, he could not pull out of the loop. And he crashed. And then successive crashes, two, three, and four. Full tilt. One of the worst crashes, air, airplane crashes they've had in the military. One such observer said, boom, 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 boom. They crashed. Following their leader to the end, all four planes plowed in the ground. Pastor Howell, that's a terrible story. What a tragedy. One thing that I admire was their commitment to following their leader. Wherever he flew, they flew. They knew in that maneuver, the only way for that maneuver to work was for them to keep their eyes on the leader. I would submit to us tonight that we ought to have the same resolve to have our eyes focused on our leader. There are so many other influences that want to joystick us. They want to spot us. We must lock our eyes on our Savior, Jesus Christ. To looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, the beginning and the end of our faith. And wherever he goes, we go. You say, well, Pastor Howell, it looks like we're about to crash. Just hang on. My pilot never crashes. His airplane never malfunctions. His stick never is a mistake. He's just right. And our eyes on him, with our eyes on him, we have a mind that is pure. So finally, my brethren, keep your mind pure, unspotted, not just eye clean, but innocent and holy before him. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word, for your goodness. Lord, I pray you'd help us that we would have our minds cleansed and driven by you. There's a lot of things that pull at us, especially right now with the influences that can so quickly derail us or contaminate us. And Lord, help us to have a mind that is pure and holy before you. Wonder, Christian, may the Lord touch your heart tonight. If you've allowed things to contaminate your mind, other influences, or maybe you've allowed them to drive your mind, to joystick your mind, would you give your mind back to the Lord? Think on these things. You can bend a knee where you're at or bend your heart to God. Keep our, eye, keep our mind on Him and our eyes focused on Him as He leads us in the right path. You may be with us tonight and you may not know that you have a home in heaven. You may have joined us for live stream and watched maybe a few services. But maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, would you not leave this time tonight without settling that eternal question? What happens after death? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You see, God loves you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you and for me. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. We deserve to pay for our sin and we can't pay for it by being good, by being baptized or joining a church. But Jesus paid the price for us. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And though we are sinners, Jesus Christ was sinless. He lived a perfect life and a holy life. He died on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind. The Bible says he is the savior of the world, of everybody. The wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life. Life in heaven. It's a gift of God. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And by trusting Him and Him alone, believing that He died on the cross for your sins, that if you ask Him, He'll save you and He'll take you to heaven when you pass. My friend, if you never trusted Christ, would you trust Him tonight? It's not hard. The Bible compares it to taking a sip of water or eating a bite of bread. That's how simple it is. You can believe Him right where you're at, in a car, in a lazy boy, outside. If you've never trusted Christ, my friend, would you trust Him tonight? You can pray a simple prayer like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and that he was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in him and Jesus alone. And if you were to pray that and mean that from your heart, the Bible says that you can be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If, you, if you've never prayed that, would you pray that with me tonight? It's not in the words, it's with the heart. You can pray right where you're at. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. He'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And that he was buried and rose again the third day. Please save me. I trust in him and Jesus alone. If you called upon him to save you, the Bible says he did just that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you did that, would you do me a favor? If you did that, would you send me a note? Leave me a message? There's a number on your screen, an email address, and a website. If you could jot me a note, I'd love to send you a free book. and encourage you. I hope that if you've never trusted Christ, that you trusted Him today. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your son Jesus and for dying on the cross for us. Lord, help us to have minds that please you. In Jesus' name, amen.